All right, so today we're gonna to talk about the big five, which is a personality model. Now, it's one of the best personality models we have out there. Um, in psychology, one of the hard things to do and what differentiates it from a lot of like hard sciences is the fact that it's very hard to quantify psychological terms. So like, it's hard to quantify how angry someone is. If we get Trev over here and his, you know, someone says something to piss him off and his face goes red and we all, and I ask you guys like how angry on a scale of one to 100, is Trevor right now? The answer is going to be so subjective and it's going to be dependent on so many variables that we're, no, we're never going to be able to narrow down a proper answer. Some people are going to say 50, some people are just going to say 90, some people are going to say, well, if your face is red, that means you have to be over level 50 anger, but some people's face gets red easier, some people have rosacea, some people get embarrassed when they get angry. So there's way too many variables to take into account to quantify psychological measures. So there's a whole school of psychology called psychometrics and there it's actually when people try and quantify these psychological measures and they've been doing this for a while now and they've gotten fairly good at it it's getting quite reliable and one of the things that they got from the psychometrics was this big five test it's a little bit different than other personality models because it's straight up statistically derived it's just empirical data so what they did is they got all the adverbs essentially and they started correlating them with each other positively and negatively so they got all the, the, I think they maybe had like 300 or something like that adverbs and you know laziness and tardiness those are similar they're not the same word but they're similar so they maybe have like a 0.7 or maybe a 0.6 positive correlation if things have a positive correlation of one it means they are the same thing okay and when they have a negative correlation of one that means they're exact opposites so like punctuality and tardiness they would it would have like a, a, a negative correlation of one because they're they're the opposite of each other so what they did is they po they started positively correlating all these words with each other and they eventually they, they wound up with groups of things that are positively correlated and then from those groups they started correlating within the groups until they were left with five traits and that's the big five it's really weird it's not based on like you know like input from psychologists and like the, the, it's just a bunch of nerds just sitting and punching numbers and this test is actually very valid so valid in psychology means its predictive ability is very very high you can accurately predict a bunch of things with this test and this is why I like this test the best use of this test in my opinion meaning what it predicts the best is who's going to be your friend who are you going to be successful with in a romantic relationship? Because here's the thing, there's that saying opposites attract, right? And that is true to an extent, unless you're too opposite. If someone's really, really, really high in conscientiousness and like 99th percentile and someone's really, really low in conscientiousness, like first percentile, that's too different, too different. There's gonna be constant clashing going on between you guys. But if you're more mid-grade, maybe if the girl's more conscientious, she will teach you to be a little less lazy. And then if you're lower in conscientious, you're gonna teach her to relax a little bit more. And that's fine. And that's why you complete me and all that stuff. And that's why opposites attract, unless they're too opposite. Um, the best thing, in my opinion, that this test will measure, and you guys can actually find this on the internet. You can search up the big five personality test. They're quite easy to produce these tests and they're usually quite accurate. They're just basically statements like, I love being the center of attention. Strongly agree to strongly disagree on a scale. And you just answer the questions like that. But the best thing that I think it measures, as far as I'm concerned, is job performance and job satisfaction. It will predict with a great amount of accuracy which job you will be satisfied in. And that's the most important thing to me because I'm going to be working a lot until I die. And it, if I don't like my job, like, has anyone had a job here that they don't like? Like how fun is it? To, yeah, it's probably when you worked with Robbie, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I knew it, I fucking knew it. So that's gonna be really, really important. It's funny, when I, I have my per, I'm a personal trainer as well as a drug and alcohol counselor, okay? And I usually do lecture style groups like this, teaching people about the step, blah, blah, blah. The three top professions it gave me when I did mine was personal trainer, counselor, and teacher. So for me, it was like, I was like, oh, this test is amazing. And you know what? I'm a little bit obsessed with it these days because I'm like looking at people, I'm like, yep, my unconsciousness, oh, neurotic. Like, and you just start picking people out, right? It actually solves a great deal of interpersonal conflict as well. Like I had an ex-girlfriend way back in the day who was so high in conscientiousness that it was crazy. 
So conscientiousness is kind of associated with like work ethic and dutifulness, organization, like getting things done methodically. But I'm like the like really, really high conscientiousness will mimic like OCD and really, really low conscientiousness, me, <laughs> is more like ADHD. So in my point of view, in her point of view, I never did anything around the house. You never do anything. And in my point of view, you don't need to clean the entire house with a toothbrush every day. So it's weird because she's kind of right, but also I'm kind of right. And that's another thing that this test can teach you if you learn to read between the lines is sometimes two people are both right. There's just a fundamental difference in temperament which will allow you never to actually agree on anything. And if you, knowledge is power. If you know that, then you can start making compromises. So basically what happened was, hey, listen, I don't notice the things that you notice. So when you get home after work or whatever, and you notice all these things are like out of order and maybe it's a bit messy, just tell me to do it and I'll just drop what I'm doing. I'll get up and I'll do it and then I'll sit back down. That way you know it's getting done and you don't have to do it all and I don't have to like go way out of my way to try and notice everything because I will never be able to do that. So because of the knowledge of this, we both did this test, we were able to reach a compromise, which was really nice. So this test, if you, if you look into it enough or, or you like it enough or it's important to you, you can actually let it help you in a lot of different ways. Now, one of the, before I actually get into what the test is all about, one of the, the things that I like to touch on really quickly first is I always like to add in a little, a little IQ talk before I talk about the big five personality traits because IQ is also very important and it also factors into this fairly well. Now, the reason it's not part of the big five personality trait is because IQ is not a personality trait. IQ is straight up just like intellectual horsepower, like how robust of a thinker you are, how fast you can process things. It is also related to your ability to abstractly think, okay? Um, there's some things that if you have a lower IQ, you will never be able to understand, okay? So there's this guy, his name is Eric Weinstein. He's a mathematician, a physicist, and an economist. Okay, and he's ridiculously smart. I don't know what his IQ is, but I would guess it would be around maybe 170, which the, the mean, the average is about 100. Um, 15 is one standard deviation. So 150, 115 is one standard deviation of the no, uh, above the norm. 130 is two standard deviations of the norm. It's three, four, you know, 45 and then 60, right? So he's like four or five standard deviations above the mean. Now, one of the things with IQ is there's, it's kind of contentious. Some people argue about whether it exists or not, but essentially there's a two standard deviation gap, communication gap. Meaning if your IQ is two standard deviations lower than someone or higher than someone, it's going to be very difficult to have meaningful conversations. And I know if you guys have ever had a conversation with someone and you're like, no, you can't do that because it's like that. And they're like, no, it's not at all. And you, you seem to be able to relate concepts together that people find are completely unrelated. And you have to like walk them through the train of thought that it took you to get to there. And then they go, oh, now I under, that's kind of, it, it, it doesn't mean you won't be able to communicate. Obviously, you'll still be able to communicate fine. But when you're studying complex ideas, what's going to happen is you're going to have to walk them through a lot of stuff. But, and, and I've noticed I have a, I'm a lot higher than some people, but then you get to some guy like Eric Weinstein and he's as, his was, he was saying things in plain English to me and I couldn't even understand what he meant by that. I was like, what do you even mean? He was like talking about, the, he was on, it was on a Joe Rogan podcast. He was talking about these things in physics called spinners, which allow, you know, if you do, if you do like a 360, it doesn't point back at you. You have to do like a 720 for it to, and I'm like, I have no idea what the fuck this guy's talking about. So some people are too smart for me. I'll never be an astrophysicist or a theoretical astrophysicist. It's just beyond my abilities. Lots of people who their IQ isn't really the highest, maybe it's average, but they work their ass off. So here's the thing, IQ is the number one predictor of long-term life success. Not just success at anything, because if you get me and Bill Gates and you're like, fight to the death, I'm gonna fuck Bill Gates up every single time. Or if you're like, play basketball against Stephen Hawking, maybe rest in 
chicken piece, you know? I'm going to win against Stephen Hawking, although he would absolutely annihilate me in any kind of like intellectual like endeavor. So IQ, but here's the thing. Also, the number two best predictor would be conscientiousness, extremely high predictor of long-term life success because it's associated with dutifulness, you know, responsibility, showing up on time, leaving on time, everything needs to get done, everything that needs to be done the right way. They're just always doing stuff. So that's often the higher conscientious, like I'm so low in conscientiousness that I cry myself to sleep every night. So I have, I have decent IQ, but someone who's way lower in IQ than me that has higher conscientiousness is going to beat me at life, at the game of life, because they'll just work their asses off. I find it extremely difficult to do anything other than just stand in front of you guys and fucking talk my ass off. That's like my only skill other than video games that I seem to be able to do for a long period of time, like sustained mental effort. You know what I mean? Probably because my extroversion is off the charts and it provides me with a lot of positive emotion to be able to stand in front of people and talk. IQ though, it's kind of shitty and people don't necessarily like talking about it that much because there's, you can't raise your IQ. You have your IQ, all you can do is slow it from declining. So you're born with it. It seems to have a lot to do with the actual physical structure of your brain. So if your synapses are jacked, essentially, you're gonna be having a higher IQ. People with higher IQs are resistant to brain damage. Okay, so there's something called the bell curve and there's a guy named Charles Murray, he wrote about the bell curve. There's um, some differences in race for IQ, so he's saying like uh, Hasidic, no, no, Ashkenazi Jews have the highest IQ out of any population, and you know, that, that's racist, like you can't say that, blah, blah, blah. He got in huge trouble for it, but it's something called the bell curve. Hey, your booty. <laughs> something called the bell curve. So 100 IQ would be right here, right? It's the mean, then there's like 115, and then there's like whatever, 85, and that's one standard deviation below the mean, one standard deviation above the mean. Now, in this category, like, I think it's probably about 75% of the world falls in between here. There's not that many people below 85, and there's not that many people above 115. They actually say, as far as IQ goes, the sweet spot would be roughly 130, in between 125 and 135. 140 is when you, when you enter like genius level. And, and if you have that, it doesn't mean you're a genius because usually genius is also associated with accomplishment. So like you can have a high IQ, but if you sit in your house doing heroin every day, it's not gonna be, you're not, I wouldn't consider you a genius. So you can have really high IQ, not perform, but apparently 135 and between 125 and 135, your IQ is high enough that you could basically enter into any profession and be quite proficient at it, but not high enough so that you start to become weird and socially awkward, you know? If you get to 135, that's in the top, that's in the top one percentile. It would be, you'd be in the 99.98 percentile. It's gonna be approximately one in a thousand, no, it's like one in 200 or something, but you get to like 137 and it's like one in a thousand. As soon as you get to here, it just drops off. Like the people who have 140 and higher are like 99.9999th percentile. So I think Einstein was supposedly had like, some people say like 220, but that's absolutely ridiculous. He probably had about like 190. Jordan Peterson has like in between 150 and 160, somewhere in between there. Sam Harris probably say maybe 150. Ben Shapiro probably has about 140, which is all, you're high enough to do anything you want. No, we don't really need, that's IQ. You're born with it, it doesn't go up, it only goes down. You can significantly decrease the speed in which your IQ goes down, mainly with diet and the best thing, exercise. Exercising is by far the best way to, to retain all your cognitive abilities into old age. And, Lot, it starts dropping when you're like 25, which kind of sucks. But if you look at lots of old people, they're super smart. Like all the guys right now who are considered like public intellectuals, like influential thinkers and all that stuff, normally they're like 50. Because what happens is there's crystallized IQ and there's fluid IQ. Crystallized IQ is stuff that you know. So that tends to increase over time because you just start to learn more stuff as you get older. Fluid IQ is processing speed thinking on your feet type stuff. That's the one that really starts to decline. Okay, uh, that's IQ. Now to the personality traits. So 
<laughs> I don't know you guys well enough to be able to just start being like, you're this and you're that and start judging you. Maybe Trev, but I won't single him out. So conscientiousness, okay? This is the, this is the number two best predictor of long-term life success. It's separated into industriousness and orderliness. Okay, so if you are conscientious, you guys will always be on the move. You will act as if driven by a motor. You will always be doing stuff. You'll go home and you'll be like, ah, oh, I just got off work. Ah, and you like look in the fridge and there'll be like a little bit of juice that you've like spilt. And then you'll just be like, God damn. And you'll take every single thing. If you're really extreme, you'll take everything out of the fridge. You'll clean the entire fridge. You'll put everything back in. When you put everything back in, you'll notice that you're almost out of milk. So you'll take an inventory of everything that's in your house, write it on a list, leave the house, go grocery shopping, come back, start putting everything away. And anything that's even a little bit dirty that's in your way, you'll clean the shit out of it. People who are high in conscientiousness are always just getting shit done. Okay. There's no real differences in gender when it comes to conscientiousness, uh, uh, it tends to gradually increase with age, which is good. So if you guys are like ADHD style people who are procrastinators like me and can't seem to get anything done, you'll probably get better as time goes on. Guys like Trev, I know Trev's very conscientious because he's always, he's always working his ass off, runs a business, he's always picking people up, he's starting meetings, he's got a million sponsors, he's going, 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 going. And the, the, you know, you can be too high and you can be too low. There's advantages and disadvantages to wherever you fall on the spectrum. Disadvantages, you're always stressed out and you're always doing something, you don't take enough time for yourself. Disadvantages here, you get a lot of time for yourself, but you don't do anything <laughs> about like your problems or like sh you don't clean it, like shit that you need to do to, to be successful in life, you probably won't do them, okay? So then that's industriousness, okay? Then there's orderliness as well. So orderliness is straight up organization. This can be organization physically or mentally, okay? So this can be organization around concepts. Take my father, for example. He's one of the most orderly people that ever fucking walked the face of this planet, okay? So we were golfing one time. And like, let's just say I live here and the golf course is here and we're driving back. He wants to go like this because it's nice and clean, just a simple L shape. When I drive home, depending on when the light turns red or how many fucking jackasses are in front of me, I'm going like this and I'll get home. Just, and sometimes it takes me longer to get home. Sometimes it takes me shorter to get home. When I was driving my father home, he's not super familiar with the area that I live in, but like about like halfway through, he caught on. And I was already fully aware of this test and I know his orderliness and it's hilarious to me. I used to always bother me until I understood what was going through his mind because I always just thought he was a jackass and he always thought I was a jackass. So we're driving home and he starts looking around and I see him become like slightly agitated, like increasingly more agitated. He's like, are you? changing streets depending on when the light goes red. And I was like, yes. And, and but he, as he said the next sentence, he got angry. He's like, doesn't that take you longer to get home? And I just burst out laughing because he was actually mad. He actually got mad at me because the weird part, like if you're looking at a trait like extroversion, this is a positive emotional trait. When I'm at being extroverted, I get a tremendous amount of joy from it. People who are conscientiousness, all, they don't get any juice from it, all they get is the removal of disgust. So when I'm being extroverted, I get super happy, I get charged up. When people are being conscientious, they're just staving off all the, the negative emotion. So it's like, if you're really conscientious, you're gonna organize stuff. The only positive emotion you'll experience is relief oh, that everything's organized. And then well, you'll notice something else that needs to be organized and you're off again. And you're permanently running away from disgust. Okay, and I use the word disgust because it's actually a system that's instantiated in our nervous system. Real disgust, like disgust is yeah, a word, like ooh, that's disgusting. Actual disgust, if you're talking with biologists, is like when you, you know when you see a spider? <gasps> that's disgust. When, Indiana Jones, snakes. Have you guys ever walked into a bathroom after someone's taking a poo in there? And you're like, oh, what the f? That's actual disgust. Does anyone in here hate loogies? Loogies. When I see like a big loogie, I'll actually get, I'll, I really, really don't, <laughs> look, yeah, she, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's funny. So that's disgust. High conscientiousness is associated with low disgust threshold. So it's a disgust sensitivity, okay? So it's like, when I'm, when, 
remember I told you I lived with someone who was ridiculously conscientious and I'm ridiculously low. Funny thing too, having a higher IQ will actually raise your disgust sensitivity. So not only am I not conscientious, I've got above average IQ, so then it's like my, I, it takes a lot to disgust me. For some reason, loogies really do it for me, but you know, if I walk into our apartment, okay, and I get home and the corner of the bed's not made and the light is shining through the uh, sliding glass door and, and all the little, you know, on the hardwood, the little specks are there. There's a little bit of dust on the black coffee table and there's like a bag of chips that's on the counter that's like not in the cupboard and they, there's like a couple cups. Like I don't notice anything. I literally don't notice anything. I just go and sit down and I, I, there's, I don't get, my radar doesn't get triggered. But then when the high conscientiousness person comes home, oh, notices it all right away, can't help themselves. Ha they have to, they'll notice it because it's not orderly and they'll have to do something because they're industrious. Have to, will not be able to stop. And this particular person I was talking about, if I really wanted to piss her off, I would open all the cupboards in the kitchen and I would leave the house. Maximum five minutes, maximum. And that's like intense, sustained mental effort to not go and close those things. Now there's a little bit of mental health issues going on there as well, but also very, very high in conscientiousness. Okay, number two bet, bet predictor of job performance. Okay, IQ, if it's a simple job, it w won't really predict how well you do the job. It will predict the speed in which you learn it, but let's say you get a super genius and a guy who's a standard deviation below the mean, and you're like, dig this hole, put all the stone in this crusher and then pour this glue and water in it and then, you know what I mean? The guy with a higher IQ will learn how to do that faster, but after they've both learned how to do it, there's no, then conscientiousness becomes the predictor of who's going to be more successful at that job. Okay, so if you guys are really, really high in conscientiousness, you'd be a very good administrative staff person, you'd be good at organizing, you'd be, like a, you'd be a good warehouse organizer, anything that involves doing things and organizing, administrative stuff, you're gonna be very, very good at that and you're gonna like it to some extent. You're just gonna be a natural at it. So that's conscientiousness. It's a good, it's a good one. Um, then we got neuroticism. Oh shit, this is the negative emotional dimension. Neuroticism is essentially your guys' susceptibility to negative emotion. So if there's that one person, that one special person in your guys' life that's always complaining about something and they're always getting worked up over something or their face gets red and they're like, oh God damn, then most likely this person's going to be neurotic, okay? It's associated with how much serotonin you have kind of. The more serotonin you have, the less susceptible you are to negative emotion, meaning the less neurotic you are. Now, the two facets that it's split up into are a bit, they're a bit hard to spot because they're, op they're almost opposite from one another, which is weird how they ended up here in the first place, but volatile and withdrawal. So some people, when they reach that level where they're just fucking stressed or whatever, they just shut down altogether. This is more my style. I normally don't nag and like fucking, I just turn on the tube, fucking eat chips, just zone out completely. Positive side to that is I don't have to worry about anything. Negative side, I don't solve any of my problems and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and then they have a mental breakdown and then I recover and then I solve all my problems and I restart the cycle all over again. Anybody? Anybody like that here? That's it, yeah? Okay, so, and then there's volatile. So volatile is like you immediately will act out your, your negative emotion. So if you're sad, you'll be really sad. If you're mad, you, you get really irritable. You're like, stop doing that, don't do that. You'll be really naggy and you'll always confront the problem. If you're really high in volatility, you'll always just confront the problem right away. The shitty part about that is we're drug addicts and alcoholics, so lots of times that we make problems where they don't even exist, and if we're volatile, we're gonna be reacting to problems that don't actually exist, okay? So if you have guys have ever had a girlfriend who's neurotic, you're gonna be sitting there after a hard day's work, and they'll just be like, what's going on? And you're gonna be like, what is going on? They're like, why aren't you talking to me? You're like, I don't know. I didn't notice. No, what's going on? And you better think of a good reason that you're not talking to them because they need it. If you're like, oh, I don't know, maybe I just, I, I'm a bit tired. Nope, not good enough for them because they sense danger of some kind and they, you need to have a plausible reason why you should be as upset as you are even though you're not upset. They just make up the fact that you're upset because they're neurotic. Neurotic people are like this. Now, the, the weird part about neuroticism, there's a couple traits that men and women differ. This is one of them. 
big surprise. Women are higher in neuroticism than men on average, but not by very much. This is how the trait is distributed amongst the population, okay? There's not a whole lot of difference in, like if I said you were more neurotic than him right now, I would maybe be right only 60% of the time, okay? Not that much more. It's not that much of a difference, but the differences really manifest themselves at the ends of the spectrum. So the least neurotic people on this planet are mostly all men, and the most neurotic people on this planet are mostly all women. And the thing about that is you only notice at the ends of the spectrum. You don't notice, oh wow, that person's very averagely neurotic. You never hear anyone say that. But when you see someone like Forrest Gump, who's just like, he gets shot. He's like, something bit me. You know, obviously that guy's not very neurotic. A neurotic person would be like, oh my God, they'd get like a cut and they'd be like, I'm gonna fucking die, oh my God. And they would literally think that they're gonna die. So you only notice the extremes of any of these traits, really. The, 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 the real differences manifest in the extremes and the most neurotic people on this planet are women, the least neurotic people. So if you were, let's just say, cliff jumping, okay, and you were really neurotic, what you would do is you'd look, you'd make every single one of your friends go first, okay? You'd be like, oh, no one jumped in that spot. Has this happened to you before? <laughs> yeah, okay? And then, you, and then you'd hire a dive team to go scour the bottom to make sure there was no sticks that were gonna poke you and stuff like that. And then after the dive team did its thing, you'd be like, okay, maybe I'll go. If you're really not neurotic, there'd just be like an 80 foot cliff and there'd be like rocks everywhere and they're like, you have to land in this little part and you'd just be like, okay, durr, and you do it. You just do it. Like, you know the buffaloes that just run off the cliff in Alberta back in the day? Those would be low neuroticism animals. They're just like, durr, and they would just jump off a cliff without thinking about it. Now, again, pros and cons to wherever you fall on the spectrum. Neurotic, if you're neurotic, you will create problems a lot and you will be stressed out a lot, but you will also solve problems before they get too out of hand. If you're low in neuroticism, there could be a guy just right behind you with a gun and you just be like, do, 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 and you die. Okay, these problems will grow. You won't care, oh, it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal, then all of a sudden there's two. If you're low in neuroticism and low in conscientiousness, you're gonna have a, have a rough go. <laughs> you're gonna have a rough go at life. If you're high conscientiousness, high neuroticism, and, and you're someone's boss, they're really not gonna like you. Like they are not gonna like you at all. They're going to be all over you. They're gonna be absolutely obsessed with keeping everything organized with dates and times. Like if you don't have those TPS reports in by Monday, you're fucked. The boss is gonna, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and get you to work on Saturday. They're gonna nag you and you're gonna be like, I wanna shoot you in the face. Was that a bit too harsh? So that's neuroticism. Okay, I'll do this next one and then we'll go on break and then we'll be done for the day. So extroversion. Is anyone, you guys know what this is already, right? Extroversion? Is anyone here extroverted? Yeah, so extroverted is, is the positive emotional dimension. So the more extroverted you are, the more positive emotion. If your parents were very encouraging when you were a kid, you're gonna be extroverted when you grow up most likely. If they're like, you're awesome, oh, great job, oh, good for you, and they're very supportive in their nurturing of you, you're gonna be fairly extroverted. If they're more of like a tough love, like every once in a while when you win your 17th trophy, your dad's like, I like you. You know what I mean? You're not going to be very extroverted. You're going to be a little bit more stoic, yada, yada, blah, blah. Obviously, I had very supportive parents. So this trait is separated into two dimensions, extroversion proper and assertiveness. So extroverted is like gregariousness, kind of like outgoing, like life of the party, like, hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, throws himself into new social situations, likes to be the center of attention at, at the extreme, yada, yada, blah, blah, loves people. Like, I'm really highly extroverted. If I'm walking down the road, and, and I, or if I'm just like at a bus stop, or I'm like at a store, and I like end up talking, like, like the clerk like fumbles her bills, and I like make a joke, and like they laugh, I'll be like, that person is just so great. Like, I just love it. I just love talking to strangers. It's kind of weird. People don't really like it these days, especially in Vancouver and Whistler. It worked out for me quite well, though. And then there's assertiveness. And assertiveness, you guys will know what that means. It's like how a guy or a girl treats their dog. Stop it. <laughs> no. Bad. Drop it. 
It's just being assertive, you know what I mean? It's also asserting your opinion. So I'm filming right now, I got out of the camera, most of you guys have been quiet. Trevor's asked some questions, he doesn't mind. He, he asserts himself, that's an assertive behavior. So Trevor would be really high in assertiveness. I would say you're more assertive than extroverted. But Trevor's always hugging everybody, he's always doing the thing, he doesn't care if he's met you before, he's just like, hey, hugs, not drugs. <laughs> you know, he does that kind of stuff. So that's a very extroverted behavior. Assertive doesn't necessarily mean you're saying no to somebody. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be like, stop that, fuck you. It could be completely on the opposite end of the spectrum. I agree. Someone says something and you just, I agree with that. That's an assertive behavior too. If you guys are the Knights of Columbus and you're sitting at the round table and you're like, I got an idea, that's also an assertive behavior. That's an extroverted, outgoing behavior, but it's also an assertive behavior because you're asserting your position. So yeah, I know for a, yeah, you are really extroverted and you guys are also really extroverted. If you're really, really assertive, that would, that is correlated with like having like, see the reason why it's not so much correlated with agreeableness, and we only knew this after, anyone in their right mind would say these are very correlated with each other. Yeah. That's the weird part about this test, just because it's statistically derived, yeah. because assertive doesn't have to be a negative or a positive. Yeah, yeah. It can be asserting that you agree with someone or asserting that you disagree with someone. Yeah. Okay, so then we got agreeableness. What do you guys think? Any differences between men and women on this agreeableness trait? Mm -hmm. What would you guys guess? Women are more agreeable. What would you guys guess? Anybody got guesses? Well, hey. he's right. Women are more agreeable. Now, the theory behind this, behind why women are more, are more agreeable and more neurotic is essentially, this is what, there's a guy named Jordan Peterson. He's a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. He said a very interesting I guess quote, he says it sometimes. He says, why would you think a female's nervous system is geared towards her? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? It's her fucking nervous system. But he's like, why wouldn't you assume that her nervous system is geared towards taking care of a baby? I was like, oh, that's kind of like, in a biological sense, the meaning of life is survive so that you can have babies and then die. That's basically it. So it would make sense for a female's nervous system to be attuned to a baby. So in when a baby is really, really young, you never say no to a baby. You always say yes. Baby cries all day, every day. Every time it makes a noise, here's a bunch of food, here's a bunch of titty milk, <laughs> here's shelter, here's warmth, here, check for injuries, like are you sick, here's some, like the child, uh, you have to do this for a child, especially in the first year, or else it's gonna develop significant, moderate to severe mental health issues, okay? After a year, you can be like, you're just fucking making shit up now. But before that, they don't make things up. They're just, if they're, they're, it's for a reason, if they're fucking around. And same with neuroticism. You need to be susceptible to the negative emotion of the baby, as well as because evolutionarily speaking, men weren't always civilized. They raped, they murdered, they fucking wanted to kill other babies. Like, it was like danger, it was way more dangerous for a woman, so they had to be able to spot danger ahead of the rest of the people. So not only to protect your baby from harm from the outside, but per to protect the baby from just like basic biological necessities. Babies can't feed themselves. They can't clothe themselves. They can't, they can't do anything. They're very, very weak and they're very fragile. All they can do is go Mah. There could be a million different things wrong with them. All they can do is cry about it. It's up to the mother to just know, intuitively know, and it's really, really funny. There's something going on in my personal life right now that's not the greatest. Um, every once in a while this happens for me. My mom goes, Joey, are you okay? Every single time, she knows. And I was, and just today I finally asked her, I was like, how do you know that? She's like, I don't know, there's a rhythm to our communication and it's been broken. I was like, that is fucked up that you're aware of that. But that's what moms are like. They're very attuned to the child, okay? So agreeableness, politeness, and compassion. If you're low in agreeableness, it doesn't guarantee that you're an asshole, but it's a good indicator that you're an asshole. You could be one of those redneck saints, as I like to call them. You know those like gruff tradesmen with a heart of gold? They're like, just get it done. Like, I'm cold, they're like, I don't give a shit. But then, then, then you like go into your truck and they just like have given you their jacket. You're like, they're like, don't mention it. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, those type of people, you could be a really good guy and you could be low in agreeableness. Now, if you're, let's just say, a drug and alcohol counselor, if you're low in agreeableness, which I am, it'll be like this. It'll change your style of how you do your job. So someone like me will be more interested in providing solutions to problems than to hearing the problems themselves. I like to hear the problems. I like to analyze the problems. I like to ask questions. I'm very interested in that kind of stuff. But if you repeat the pro if you j some people just want to be heard. 
And those type of people, I don't jive with that well. Although I admit I'm one of those people. I just want to be heard. I just want to be like, I just want me to be saying, you know what, Joey, you're doing great. I just want a little bit of encouragement, but I don't like to give that much encouragement for whatever reason. I like to solve people's problems. I more than I enjoy just talking them out. You know what I mean? People who are really high in agreeableness will, will like to hear out the problems more than coming up with solutions. I'm just like, oh, that, this is what you do about it. Done. See ya. You know what I mean? Not in like a douchebag way, but like, I like to wrap the problems neatly in a bow. If you're, if you're high in agreeableness and you're a boss and your employee shows up late, let's just say there's a high agreeableness guy and a low agreeableness guy. Your employee shows up late a bunch of times in a row. The low agreeableness guy is going to be like, he's fired. Done. We gave him enough warnings. He's fired. Done. And the high agreeableness person will be like, well, their parents got sick and you know, the traffic is really bad and oh, he does, you know, give you another chance. Now, again, both points of view are correct. That's the fucked up part. That's what this test really taught me is that sometimes there's two right ways of doing things. Okay. And this also at the level of the individual, these manifest and they also manifest themselves at the level of a society. People who are really high in conscientiousness and low in openness will be conservative. People who are high in openness and low in conscientiousness will be liberals. Okay. That's where like the, the, the whole gender craze and everything like that's coming and the needing for borders and stuff like that is all conscientiousness driven. It's all their need for borders, clearly established borders. When you get a trans person saying that, uh, your, your specific chemical makeup and, and your appendages and other factors determine your gender. There's now 28 genders. <laughs> Conservatives don't like that because now there's too many categories and there's too many variables and it's too open to interpretation. They go, God damn it. No, <laughs> they just say there's a man and there's a woman and that's it because they're so concerned with borders and keeping things orderly that they don't like that shit. Liberals, they, they're not concerned with borders. They want fluidity. They want free flowing information. They don't want borders. Lots of them don't even believe in countries. They don't think we should have borders. Not only should we not build a wall in the Southern United States, we shouldn't even have countries. You should be able to go wherever you want, wherever you want, no immigration papers, yada, 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 blah, blah. And it's the, this, these two opposing forces that, that are constantly at odds with each other. And obviously when the truth is going to be the best course of action is going to be somewhere in the middle. So both of these types of people are necessary and evolutionary psychology says that the only reason these traits exist in the first place is because there's an evolutionary adaptation. There's an advantage, an adaptive advantage to having any of these traits. And if there isn't, they're not going to be traits for much longer. Now, obviously they're, they're going to last longer than our measly lifespan, but you know, in, in the course of human time, some of these traits might disappear. We don't know. Okay. That's agreeableness. Last one. Sorry for taking so long. Openness. This one is the intellectual slash creative domain. Okay. There's going to be aesthetics and there's going to be ideas. Sometimes the ideas one is called intellect and sometimes the aesthetic one is called open to idea or open to experience. So this is something like art and this is something like science. Okay. Aesthetic people are interior designers. They're graphic designers. They like to arrange parties. Like I lived with a chick who was very, very high in aesthetics more so than ideas. And I would be like, it'd be like, you know, December 1st and I'd get home from work and I'd, it, everything would be normal. And I'd take a nap and I'd wake up in the entire house. There's like Christmas decorations. There's like fake snowflakes all over the walls. All the windows are sprayed with the fake snow. There's like Santa, fucking everything, salt shaker, Santa, t like drying towel, like er the whole house. Oh, this is so nice. And when they make food, as long as the food doesn't taste like shit, they're going to be more concerned with the presentation of the food than what the food actually tastes like. As long as it doesn't taste bad. That's they're more of an artsy person. Music. If you guys do music, if you guys compose or record, do that kind of stuff, you're probably going to be higher in openness. Okay. If you guys just can't do anything without music, you're going to be higher in openness. And then there's ideas. If you guys are just endlessly like Trevor, I know you for a fact, you're like the Emerald Tavern to like, you're going into like alchemy and like Eastern wisdom traditions and like Buddha. And you're just always taking in information based on that kind of stuff. You have an endless appetite for it as do I. Like I remember one time, one of my friends is like, Oh, I have heartburn. And I was like, that's cool, bro. And then like a while later, he's like, I still have heartburn and it hurts. It might lead to esophageal cancer. And I was like, well, just stop it. He's like, I can't. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> please help me. And I was like, oh, I wonder what it is. So I go on the internet. 
I go on the internet and I figure out there's something called silent reflux. Silent reflux. It's like persistent over time chronic condition. So what happens is certain, a cert, to a certain percentage of the population, if you have acid reflux, normally people take acid, antacids. Okay? But what antacids do is they don't make the acid reflux hurt less or they don't make it less. They just make it hurt less because they make your stomach acid so alkaline it doesn't hurt as much. But it's still there and it still erodes your esophagus. But what happens when you have this is that because it doesn't hurt as much, you don't actually solve the problem. It makes your stomach acid more alkaline. So acid reflux is bacteria inside your gut that eat carbs predominantly and they fart a bunch. And when there's enough fart that builds up, it goes and that's what acid reflux is. So when you eat antacids and you have chronic heartburn, you're making your stomach acid alkaline so the bacteria that eats the carbs have a perfect environment to grow. So that it's the perfect temperature for them. Also, because there's less acidity, it doesn't break down the carbs as fast. So you have that food just sitting in there. So they're basically on their tropical paradise island and they're growing and they're multiplying. And although it doesn't hurt as much, it gets worse and worse over time. So what you can do is develop, you can get a diet that's based on getting everything through your digestive system as fast, like a fast tracked diet, the road to health is paved with good intestines. Okay. And that can actually solve the problem. So the only reason I know that is because he just mentioned it and I had to, re that's a sign of openness. Openness is the highest correlated with IQ. These are the brainiacs and the artists. Okay. So that's the big five. Thank you for listening.